All right, I think we're live. So my name is Lizzie Knowlton. And I'm JC Clayton. And this so, is our Amazing Grace Google Hangout. Yep. All right, so we'll start with question one. What doctrine in Wilbur's heart drove him to advocate? Why is the doctrine of the family so important to have in your heart to be passionate and persistent? Um, I remember at, towards the beginning of the um, of the movie, he said he mentioned that God created all men equally. And I think that's a great doctrine that he had in his heart, um, and I know that he truly believed that because um, uh, I'm reading my answer real quick. Sorry. No, that's um, okay. Oh, so he was really confused about whether he should do God's work or continue in politics. And the doctrine that men are, all men are created equally is kind of what gave him that confusion. He didn't know what he should do. Um, and he saw that the way that the slaves were being, being um, treated were not, was not fair and that all men should be treated equally and that that just wasn't right. He, he saw it as injustice. Um, I think also a doctrine that he had was God's love for children, for his children. Um, and so that's why he's so passionate about the abolition of slavery. And um, he just knew that uh, of the love that God had for his fellow men. And he felt that love as well. Um, yeah. Do you have any, any yeah, things? Like those were most of the ones that I thought of, I yeah. mean, clearly like the, the equality for all mankind was a mm -hmm. huge one. Um, I thought also you could really see how, um, <laughs> at least the movie made him out to be very well read because like his servant comes and like quotes these, you know, philosophical quotes to him. And I think that those, those viewpoints were also going through his head, like the consideration of these things and realizing that the real world didn't match up with like what these things are supposed to be or what, what he had been reading about. And then, um, I, like along with, you know, your, what you said about him, like knowing God, I think that he, um, the influence of his preacher friend, John Newton, I think was his name. Yeah, John Newton. Um, had had like a, a large effect on him. I actually looked up a little bit about William Wilbur Force's life mm -hmm. and he was really only in contact with that preacher for about like two years. Mm -hmm. He was living with his family and then was shipped off to a wealthy aunt and, un aunt and uncle for two years and then brought back home. And so mm -hmm. in that brief period of time, like this preacher had like a huge impact on him um, and the song Amazing Grace. So like you can see that those things like really came to, came to a role in his life um so that that's all i would add basically yeah. got, it on, got all the thoughts so no yeah that's good um and then to like address the second part of the question why is the doctrine of the family so important to have in your heart to be passionate and persistent um i don't know i just kind of thought like the doctrine of the family helps us to be passionate and persistent because our it um, it is our families that need us the most. And so when we have those, our children depending on us, we want to continue uh, pushing forward and stay motivated in, um, in, in pushing for their rights and for their safety and their, um, you know, just their um, ability to uh, have like, you know, have their childhood and have their family. Um, and that goes along with any family, you know, uh, that we are advocating for. So that was just a little thought I had. Do you have any thoughts on that second part? Yeah, so um, I kind of tied it into the passion that William Wilber Wilberforce had for his cause. Um, mm -hmm. There's a phrase that Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien uses, um, sorry, I'm nerdy. <laughs> <But> <laughs> This is to explain um, how the elves fought this battle that they knew that they were going to lose. And it was called the long defeat. And I feel like um, when William Wilberforce 
entered into the abolition movement, that's kind of how a lot of people viewed it. And including himself, I think, to an extent. Like, he had a hope that he could change it, but, like, he realized that it was going to be, like, a really long, drawn-out battle. Mm -hmm. um, and just with what we learned with um, like the stuff going on at the United Nations and how there are these groups that are so politically active almost against families in many ways and like the traditional family um, and knowing that we're going to lose battles um, like we already have and facing like kind of the feeling of a long defeat. I don't know if you ever felt that way through the semester, but I was like, like there's no way to win. Like <laughs> there's nothing I can do uh, to make like an impact. And um, But I mean, we know that eventually we will win and that like that the family will um, be protected and it will be very difficult at times. But like ultimately if we keep fighting and pushing, like these values will come back and the family can be protected mm -hmm. again. So, um, and I think, I guess to, to bring it back exactly to the question, like being able to have that perspective as you go into a battle that seems in many ways like a losing and discouraging battle, um, you have to feel so passionate about those things because it would be so easy to give up on them, you, mm -hmm. you know, the first, second, third time that you were defeated. Like, I don't yeah. know how many times um, they actually presented the bill, but the movie takes place over like 17 years, right? So I, clearly, yeah. it's probably like at least four or five times that they brought it before Congress yeah. before anything was done about it. So, um, and like having so many people against you, not having that support, you really do seriously need to be very passionate about it <laughs> or else yeah. it'd be so hard yeah and being able to make it a cause that other people are passionate about as well like we saw that through the movie like they were able to bring their passion to the masses that first time that they presented the bill where people started like striking on sugar and wearing yeah. pins and reading equiano's book and um i you know I, I think back to our persuasive um writing assignment and I chose a threat that I was interested in, but I had not really had any personal experience with. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard for me to write that paper because I was like, I don't know how to make this. Like, yeah, that's right. you know, like it's, a, it's interesting and I feel that it's a threat, but like, I don't know how to like present it to people. And I think that that would, you know, like that my paper was less effective in that way. And so it's something that you have to, like really feel passionate and be able to like bring that to the other people. Yeah. yeah great points. Cool. All right. So we'll move on to question number two. How did um, William employ a theoretical um, Bronfenbrenner approach to become a more effective advocate? Identify at least one thing in each system and be specific. Um, so some moments specifically from the movie that I felt like they kind of like reference um, Bronfenbrenner's model even though they probably were just <laughs> not but like <laughs> the, the, that was referenced um, there's a part where they're meeting first is like the very first time as advocates and um, William says we'll start at the beginning the first step we're talking about truth so we should hand it out to people from church roofs paint pictures of it write songs about it make bloody pies out of it mm -hmm. um, and so just like the fact that he understood that this had to be like on every level this needed to influence people um, and then I'll talk about this in a, in a little bit but there was like the specific influence with the slave ship um, okay. and like the facts about it that the, there were twice as many slaves as there were births for um, and the phrase like remember the Madagascar um, so let's see so then looking at each level um, so at the micro system in the first meeting he has with the abolitionist parties he mentions that there is only one there outside of his own family attending and I'm not sure that, um, 
uh, if the, it meant like literally his family uh, mm -hmm. but, or like his kin, but I took that to mean that like he had brought the issue to the attention of his own family. Um, and we see throughout the movie that he is very vocal with his peers um, about this, the slave trade. So that's also like a microsystem level where it's, um, you know, your interaction with your peer group. Okay. And through his vocalness, he made some friends and lost some others. Um, do you have anything you want to? I can either go through all the systems and you can add on at the end, or we can go system by system. Keep going. That's okay. you're doing good. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so then at the meso system, I felt like we see that William is very successful in bringing up the issue in his workplace, the Parliament, um, in the House of Commons. Um, mm -hmm. The issue was received by all the members very differently. Um, some pledging to support the support the cause while other pledged to be against him. But there's little doubt that he got the issue being talked about um, where it wasn't being talked about before. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't know how many times he had to push his bill, but we know it's something that he had to bring up multiple times mm -hmm. um, and continually rouse interest in order to be talked about at that level. Um, and then at the EXO system level, um, we see that William and his ab his fellow abolitionists were working out in the community. It talks about that year and a half period of time where they were like gathering research and getting that petition signed and um, Equiano writes his book and they like it becomes in vogue to um, swear off slave harvested sugar. Um, so they made the topic more generally available to the community's mind. Um, and then at the macro system, I think we see really the crux at, at like the crux or like the climax of the movie where the bill passes because it's like at the governmental level. Um, so we see that he eventually was able to make you know that small change first with the American flag being flown and then through the efforts of everything that he has done previously, like the legislation is changed, which then goes on to affect all the other levels um, down. Mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't know if we needed to talk about the chrono system, which is like the, over the time scale. But mm -hmm. I was just like, well, the, the movie roughly takes place over like 15 or 17 years. Um, and during this time, we see like the political and social climate change a lot. Like when they first are bringing up the bill, a lot of people are in support of it. And um, the population of England like really kind of thrusts themselves behind him. And then during the years of the French Revolution, it becomes kind of, uh, what did they use, sedition? Like they um, viewed it as sedition and like being kind of like a traitor and on the edge. And so it was like no longer being talked about and he couldn't bring it up in the same way. And then once that ended, like you see again that like it's an issue that can be talked about. So I think, you know, we can see that um, time and like the events that happened throughout time kind of had like a big effect on how the overall bill like went forth and the legislation was changed and his experience was mm -hmm. changed by it. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, no, <laughs> I thought that was really good. Like I, I can, you know, like after what you said, I can, you know, see the bigger picture better. Um, you know, like from how it started small and then it got bigger, especially once the bill was passed. So that definitely cleared it up for me. I don't know why, but I just couldn't like, um, I don't know, get that through my head. Like, I don't know, how could you do in the micro system? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I got from like the little, I was looking at the diagram and I was like, well, how could it possibly affect, like what, what did he do that affected like this little level, yeah. you know, it was, it was yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I like that all of those points made, I think definitely fit in with each of those systems, so. That was good. Um, so the next question, how did Wilbur and his fellow advocates do and share their research? What evidence did they provide to persuade those op opposing, um, opposing or on the fence? So I feel like a lot of, maybe, I don't know if this is right, but I feel like a lot of his research kind of came from, um, from the stories that he heard from those that had personally experienced slavery, um, either they were slaves or they um, participated in the slave trade. 
Um, and also he was able to um, go see for himself that the ship that they were carried on from overseas. Um, so they were able to get their research from actual primary resources and, um, you know, get um, their information from the actual source that it came from. Um, what did you think? How did, what did you say about that one? Yeah, that's kind of, that's what I said. I, I kind of felt like it was interesting that it, like, called it research. Because when I think of research, I guess maybe because I'm in, like, um, <laughs> the research methods class, like, uh -huh. I'm like, oh, statistical, like they have like yeah. these numbers of like how many slaves died per load or like how many, it's just statistics. Yeah. Um, but I kind of had to be like, well, at that time they weren't really crunching numbers. Yeah. <laughs> they they might have had like some statistics like that, but like it, it like you said, it came more from like first hand accounts, like Equiano's mm -hmm. account. Um, and yeah, like taking time to share those accounts with others and, and weeding out like the ones that were um, most significant and most representative and making sure that people like, knew those stories and were acquainted with those stories and kind of the atrocities mm -hmm. that those people had to go through. So, yeah. Um, like, yeah. Maybe like statistics wasn't as important back then as, you know, at least in this case, um, not as important as, um, these actual happenings that they were able to share so yeah well and like from our what was her name Mar was it marcia barlow yes um, yeah like she talked about the importance of like a personal narrative first and i think it was actually interesting i went back and looked at that article and it she talked about how like it's nice when the data and the personal like narrative support one another, mm -hmm. but I went like from her, whatever, from her talking, yeah. from her speech, like it, I kind of was like, well, it doesn't always need to, like the data, the hard statistical evidence is not always like what is most important mm -hmm. when you're trying to lobby your cause. And so, you know, maybe in some ways, the way that the ways that things were done back then were better because now I feel like there's some like sometimes there's like paralyzation because stats like show one way but a lot of people should like feel another and like we're we like wait to to find out like the effects of a 20 year study so that we can know like the true effects of something whereas like we can kind of feel like I feel what's right but we like mm -hmm. have to wait for the statistical evidence to back it up you know yeah. so maybe like personal experience is actually better to rely on in some cases mm -hmm. so. yeah um I just for like how did they share their research I just talked about how he presented it um, in Parliament to the members that were there. Do you think that, that he did it any other way? Um, just, yeah, that and then going out into the communities, like yeah. when he talked to the people on the boat, like the dignitaries on the boat. Oh, and I them, forgot that part. Stopped by, yeah, the Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, yeah, they, they talk about this like year and a half of research that they did going into different communities, but you like you never really hear what they did other than people like kind of jumped on the bandwagon with their cause. So mm -hmm. um, they did something. I mean, I, I assume it was much like we hear about like the missionary work where it was just them like going and talking and getting an audience and building support. But, mm -hmm. So... Anything else? Do you want me to take the next question? We can go to the next one. Cool. All right. So question four, how does the film portray the importance of working together as a group? Um, what has family advocacy group work taught you? So um, on a side note, before I look at like, I'll forget it if I go right off my notes. But I also <laughs> looked at like, it talks a little bit about um, when I was reading about William Wilberforce's life, it talked about his um, relationship with Thomas Clarkson, who was like the guy that had kind of the long hair and was the one that like talked about revolution. Yeah. Um, and it just talked about how after they met, 
I think they met at least weekly for 50 years plus. Mm -hmm. So they like totally, they like had a solid relationship with one another. Um, and so kind of taking that into what I wrote out, um, just like the film portrays a group of men working together for the cause of abolition and they become basically like family. Um, they meet together, plan together, and they celebrate and lament together. Um, and everything that they did, they did it together. Um, and especially when, like, something like that is so emotionally, physically exhausting, like, I think that it's so important to have that support group. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there is a brief period of time, it seems like, from what the movie showed, that they, like, kind of broke apart after, like, um, the revolution where Equiano dies and they all kind of go their own way and kind of give it up as like a lost cause. Um, and it just showed me that like it, it's something that no one really felt the heart to do on their own. Like they, no one like stayed behind to like fight the cause on their own. Like that support group became so integral to integral. Mm -hmm. However you say that, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like the cause that they were fighting, like the support that they gained from one another, and the help that they got had from one another, mm -hmm. uh, and on like conversely, it also showed me that um, like the group can keep you going collectively, even when you're like highly discouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, once the group disbanded, the cause lost steam, uh, even though all the individuals still felt really strongly about the issue. Um, and it was only when they were working together and brainstorming as a group that they were able to get anything done. Yeah. Um, so do you have any thoughts about that first part of the question? Yeah, um, that, that's one of the points that I made was just the need for that support um, is so important for group work. Um, but also, um, when you're working as a group, there's so many um, heads that are put together to generate new ideas and to help move the cause along. Um, so, you know, when you're just working on your own, you only have your own thoughts and your own opinions. And um, it's just so important to have opinions of others, even if they're completely different from your own, to kind of, um, I don't know what the word would be, but mesh everything together just so that you have so many new perspectives to address anything that comes up. So that was one of the other points that I made. Yeah, I think that's really good because if they hadn't been like a group teamwork brainstorm mm -hmm. kind of a group, like they, it was one member, like it wasn't even like someone that was particularly, um, like influential up to that point like he'd just been the secretary right mm -hmm. but then like he was the one that presented that first idea that like got them any leverage in the door about stopping the slave trade with the ships so yeah, um, yeah I think that's a good point to bring out as well um, and then as far as what family advocacy group work has taught me um, I think the same things are really applicable in family advocacy. Um, you know, there's too much going on at any one time for just one person to hold down the fort. Like, mm -hmm. they talked about how at the UN, like, there were different people that were allowed into different rooms at the conference and that, like, some got some information and some got another and then they would, like, combine and then there were some people, like, writing up these documents to give to the dignitaries so that they understood and then there were the other people that were meeting with the dignitaries and there's just like so and like things are changing so quickly that it was it literally would have been impossible to make the same impact as just one person mm -hmm. um let's see if i put anything else down yeah that's that's kind of the main thing that i gleaned did you have anything um yeah, that's basically what I said, too. Um, but I also added, or as you were talking, I was thinking, like, <laughs> um, throughout the semester, I've had lots of group work assignments. And you have people that are counting on you, so you can't just be like, oh, I don't care what my grade ends up as. You know, I'll just, I'll just do as the minimum. Um, when you have others counting on you, you feel more, um, I guess, obligated or 
you know, you just feel the need to do your best and to keep going and to be there for the group. So that's, that just kind of came up um, as you were talking. Um, and then also, what did I write? Hang on. <laughs> oh, I basically, I was just saying, um, we've already mentioned it, but it's just so much easier to stay motivated and positive and to stay positive when you have others that are there to support you and to help you and that, you know, they're in the same stage as you. So that's basically what I wrote. Cool. <laughs> All right. Number five. What parallels did you see between Wilbur and Captain Moroni in Alma 46? Uh, what is a Christian and a professional family advocate, and how did Wilbur exemplify that? How can you be effective and Christ-like against such loud and often degrading voices? So um, I just noticed that Wilbur always stood for what he believed, and he rallied the people to defend their beliefs as well, just as Moroni did. Um, and he, he set out for the people exactly what he believed in, just as Moroni did also, um, you know, on the title of Liberty. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's getting a little dry. <laughs> um, but he said, like, in memory of our family and our children and our wives, or Liberty, I can't remember what all it was on there, but, um, he laid out what he believed in and uh, in all the bills that Wilbur presented, he did the same and in all of his speeches and whatnot. Um, and then I, th oh, do you want to add to any of that? Um, this, those were all very good points. I liked that you brought up how they both laid out what they believed in. Mm -hmm. Um, I also thought that it was interesting that both men were, um, they didn't seek after their position for sure with Captain Moroni. I don't know how much Will, like William Wil Wilberforce did or did not seek. The movie made it seem like he was asked into the position. Yeah. Uh, so like it, it was not a position of power that they sought, but that they took on because they felt like really passionate about the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were both um, leaders during social and political transitions of many years. Um, and both men's work ultimately led to more peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just the fact that they were both advocates, like offensive, offensive in the terms of like they were going forward in the battle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not like offensive. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that they they were on the attack and they they didn't take a defensive view of their topics. They like made sure that they were doing everything that they could to be one step ahead. Okay. So. Yeah, I like I like how you kind of tied in how um, I don't know, like their backgrounds and their positions were very similar to one another. That was cool. Um, so what is a Christian and professional family advocate? So I basically just uh, think that a Christian and professional advocate is one that fights for, um, fights doing God's work, but doesn't necessarily bring religion into his research and speeches. Um, he... He, he advocates using um, God's doctrine and whatnot, but he applies it, um, I guess, in a world, not worldly way, but, you know, in a secular way. Um, and I think that he exemplified that by using his religion to guide him in his political work. Um, but when he spoke uh, in Parliament, he was able to keep his language political. And yes, he believed in God, but he never brought him into the, the political discussion. So that's mm. what I thought. Um, yeah, I really loved the quote at the end by Lord Charles Fox when he <laughs> says, um, a long quote, but it's really good. I'm just going to read it all. It says, when people speak of great men, they think of men like Napoleon, men of violence. Rarely do they think of peaceful men. 
but con contrast the reception they will receive when they return home from their battles. Napoleon will arrive in pomp and power, a man who has achieved the very summit of earthly ambition, and yet his dreams will be haunted by the impressions of war. William Wilberforce, however, will return to his family, hang his head on his pillow, and remember the slave trade is no more. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that really summed up, like, like a Christian and a professional family advocate in that, like, um, we don't fight our wars and, like, um, like, aim to take people down through degradation or, um, like ripping them apart, like personally or. Sorry, just a second. I packed them in his suitcase. Um, sorry, we're getting ready to leave. So my husband is asking me. Um, so I, yeah, I just think that like being able to look back on your own. Um, actions and feeling peace about them and not feeling embarrassed or haunted by like what you did to a person like totally ripping them apart mm -hmm. or um, I just think that um, I just like how it says in the beginning like when they speak of great men they think of men of violence rarely do they think of men of peace but like we know that there were some of you know there have been peaceful men that have made uh, really really important impact in the world um, but they aren't typically the ones we think of first, but they have, they still have great power and they have more peace, peace of conscience, I think at the end mm -hmm. of the day. And, you know, I think that they're blessed by God to more in their endeavors. Mm -hmm. They strive to uphold his values. So, yeah. Cool. Um, what was the next? How can you be effective and Christ-like against such loud and often degraded, vo degrading voices? Uh, this kind of reminded me of when we did those debates where, you know, one was um, a religious point of view, the other one was kind of an atheist point of view. Um, and that taught me how important it is to be knowledgeable on both sides and to just do the best that you can to understand um, where both sides are coming from. And I think he kind of did that, especially um, with, uh, with his, um, you know, research <laughs> on all of those stories that he received from people who were um, part of the slave trade. And then, um, I don't know, just becoming educated uh, on both sides, especially, um, not a, well, yeah, I guess especially on your side, but you can use so many resources to back your argument, and um, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think it is super important to be educated on both sides. Um, some thoughts that I had kind of going along with that were, um, I really liked, I think it was in the Common Core lesson where it talked about how, um, like, one of the people that opposed Common Core was like, I believe that he's acting out of the best intentions for people. And I think that that's something that, like, I often forget is that when, like, when something opposes me, I'm like, or, like, opposes something that I feel really strongly about, I'm like, oh, you clearly have, like, ill intent or something, you know? Yeah. But, like, often people don't. Like, they feel the way they do because of something that they've experienced in their life. And so they, like, feel strongly about fighting their side. And so I think that it's important to, like, kind of try and draw as much common ground as you can because it's only, uh, like, when you are constantly, like, battling up against each other and, like, butt butting heads, um, like no progress can be made, but if, if you can like kind of find some common ground and then like work up from there, I think that um, it's much more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I know for me personally, like I tend to get kind of like hot under the collar when mm -hmm. my viewpoints are being attacked um, because clearly I'm right. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I I don't know. I just it it is like very personal to me, and mm -hmm. so I think that um, remembering that the attacks aren't a like aren't necessarily personal attacks. They're attacks against like a, an idea or a viewpoint. But yeah. I mean, sometimes they are personal, like. Clearly in politics, you see personal jibes, but yeah. um, there, and then just remembering that even if I do feel like personally attacked, um, the savior never really like acted, like, he didn't act out of um, anger or revenge. Like when he was upset, he acted out of like righteous injustice and indignation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are there are times and probably well there will be times that like that will come up that there will just be something that blatantly you're like no like that is not correct that's not okay but for the most part like going about it in a civil manner and just remembering <laughs> your head and like saying a little prayer or something to help you like keep your cool i think that for me is how i can be a more effective um advocate um one of the points that I brought out was um, watching those the view clips with Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, I remember feeling so upset. I know. Like, wouldn't let someone get a word in edgewise, and like before someone even completed their thought, just like tearing it down. Um, and I just remember thinking, like, that's so ineffective. Like, do people feel like she's making a strong case because no one can make? No, it can get a word in edgewise. And so yeah. to me, it didn't like, it just came off as obnoxious. And so I think remembering like that and being like, I don't want to be that obnoxious <laughs> person that never lets it go. Uh, yeah. So, I don't, yeah, those were, those were my thoughts. Yeah, but, I like that. You definitely do have to be like open-minded and just keep your cool even when it's so hard yeah <laughs> you know be be the example that you want you know that you want to that you want others to be yeah like, it may or may not work but you know you gotta at least try <laughs> yeah yeah for sure that's good um okay so going on to question six marcia barlow spoke on persuasive speaking and writing did Wilbur and others exemplify any of Marcia's ideas and how so? So we kind of briefly touched on this, or maybe I, I did I, <laughs> um, in an earlier question, but just um, that she talked a lot about sharing personal experience and sharing a story in order to resonate with the most amount of people. Um, and that's something that the abolitionist group in general I think used very effectively. We hear from Equiano's first person account, um, you know, like other accounts that they talked about with like people traveling to Boston, people traveling on other slave ships, um, like just the experiences and the de depravity that they saw mm -hmm. uh, and some of those things. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm reading through. I wrote in paragraph format because it's really hard for me to do bullet points. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm like trying to read through the whole thing really quick. Um, we see him sharing some of these stories with the dignitaries on the tour of the estuary. Um, and, you know, I think we also see that he's affected by these stories. Like we see him affected by Equiano's accounts as well as John Newton's like that's one that happened really early on in his life that clearly like affected him mm -hmm. his whole lifelong. Um, and then, yeah, just, uh, I liked how Marcia Barlow talked about the science behind telling stories and how it can cause the mm -hmm. listeners brains to light up in the same way that the storytellers was. And she said, um, by simply telling a story, the storyteller could plant ideas, thoughts, and emotions into the listener's brains. When you listen to the stories and understand them, you experience the exact same brain pattern as the person who is telling the story. And I think that we see that exemplified in the movie when, like, people started taking on the cause and, like, started getting really upset about um, the slave trade in general and how they 
really caught the spirit of the abolitionists as they were um, sharing these stories. So, mm -hmm. now, did you have anything? Yeah, um, just quickly. I mean, you kind of said everything that I kind of wrote down, but I like how he went and got John Newton's story because he was a slave trader. Um, and so he had that, I feel like that was kind of the story of us, you know, um, because he can connect to uh, the people that were against the abolition. Uh, he has, you know, a personal account of it. So that's all that I really wanted to add. I, I just, I like that he was a part of that whole story. Yeah. Yeah, I liked how often they brought him in and like how he was also so driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was yeah. story. He was a cool one. Yeah. Uh, what role did the government, policy, and religious freedom play in the fight to play in the fight of the slave trade? Did you see their political system being pro-family wire or not? So I saw. Um, government um, as what role wait did I even write, answer that correctly hang on a second <laughs> what role did the government okay so I thought the government um, played a role kind of in allowing the issue to be voted upon because um, the members of parliament were able to vote for or against the abolition of the state slave trade um, so that's what I said for government policy. I wasn't quite sure. I didn't answer that one. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, well, sort of. I kind of treated government and policies the same because I feel like we, yeah. they were like treated the same in the movie. Um, yeah. like, they didn't explain. I know a little bit about how parliament is set up, but not enough to be able to distinguish like government from <laughs> Policy. Yeah, I know. So, um, let me look through really quickly and see if okay. there if I mention anything specifically. Um. Yeah, kind of just like the whole movie takes place in Parliament, so it's clear that like <laughs> the government had like a big role in what we see come to pass. Um. Yeah, I I just put, I wasn't exactly sure how policy came to play out, other than. <laughs> the first step that the abolitionist group used was a policy change in mm -hmm. the American flags being flown on the ships. Um, mm -hmm. So clearly like small changes in policy can lead to like bigger changes in legislation. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have a clear answer. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and then with religious freedom, um, just being able to have, for the people to be able to have their own opinions and ideas about the slave trade um, and just about morality and whatnot. Um, and then Wilbur was able, was free to believe in God and in the Christian religion. So he was able to fight for the equality of all men. Um, I just shortly, uh, thought, I think that was one of the big roles that, re that re religious freedom played was just being able to have your own ideas about what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I thought it was really interesting that throughout the movie, you got the sense that people, um, like William's religious attitudes were negatively seen by many of the people. Like um, William Pitt talks about, like, I need to know where, like, your heart lies and, you like he then like he sees like religious texts in his home is like you read these radical ideas and kind of stuff like that um but going along with that like his viewpoints were still respected which i think is really important mm -hmm. uh, with religious freedom and i was actually in i just read Wik wikipedia so this is like <laughs> these facts that may may or may not be like well <laughs> Edited, but yeah. he talked about how, especially during that time, like having religious um, leanings in general outside of like just normal church attendance or like having them play like a part and being like 
I guess, viewed a little bit more as a zealot was like actually a very negative thing. And mm -hmm. so I think that even more goes to show how important religious freedom was in this, uh, to whatever extent it played. You know, I don't know how uh, like religiously free England actually was because they have like the Anglican church. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know all the, like, that. That kind of was, like, in, the, in the context of the religious freedom that was there, it was very important for the, for yeah. the, the legislation. So yeah. All right. Um, did you see their political system as pro-family? So I put yes and no. I put like, yeah. yeah. I know that's a really wishy-washy answer. <laughs> Maybe what did you think? I said yes, but I wasn't really sure. Yeah. I, I just. I mean, I don't know, just because of the way that it was set up so that it wasn't like a dictatorship, you know, they were able to to ha vote and to, you know, have the voice heard. So I didn't really know. That's just yeah, I, that's kind of what I put. And the fact that like one of the biggest um, arguments used against the abolition of slave trade was how it would affect the people of England and that like, especially like in the port cities, like families would be bankrupted and like families yeah. would have work and it would just like be this huge economical um, crisis. So I thought that that was, I mean, to me, I was like, well, it shows that they're like concerned about the families maybe ostensibly. I don't know, like probably yeah. there's ulterior motives behind it, but um, that they, they thought about their citizens rather than just themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put like, Clearly, they were anti-family in some aspects because they didn't consider, like, the family of the slave. Because, um, I mean, because they didn't view them as people. So they viewed them as property. And um, yeah. so, you know, hopefully with the passing of the anti-slave trade, it became more pro-family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't – I was like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, like, yeah. So – I wasn't sure either. All right. Anything else uh, on that question? No, yeah. I'll go ahead and go on to number eight. Okay. So, um, do you feel that Wilbur used his time on Earth well? How do you see him showing the elements of consecration that Elder Christofferson spoke of? So, I felt like most people would feel like Wilbur was pretty effective with his use of time. Um, he was clearly a conscientious person who worked hard to make a change um, for the better, which I think anyone would laud as um, um, like a positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the, the close of the movie, it says, William Wilberforce continued to battle injustices for the rest of his life. He transformed the hearts and minds of his countrymen on education, health care, and prison reform to accomplish his second great uh, dream, making a better world. So I just think that like anyone that dreams of making a better world and like does it in context of like also aligning their views with God, I think has made a positive impact. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, that's, that was a lot of my thoughts as well. Um, and also he was just so unselfish and he spent hardly any time on himself as always advocating for others. Um, and he did like lots of hard things that most other people would rather not do, but he was, you know, persistent and he kept going. And I like how at the end it included that he continued to fight for uh, those injustices. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and then as far as um, the elements of consecration that Christopherson, Elder Christopherson spoke of, so I really liked the quote at like the beginning of the talk, like the little summation quote that they put. Mm -hmm. It says, true success in this life comes in consecrating our lives. That is our time and choices to God's purposes. I think that that like, really um, sums up his life. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wasn't sure. So there was like a part where he mentions like five specific elements of a consecrated life purity, work, respect for one's physical body, service, and integrity. Mm -hmm. So I talked a little bit about each one of those, and we we can or cannot go into those. I, I don't know. Do you, what, what, 
<laughs> I don't care. <laughs> what do you want to do? We all hit them up really quickly. So, okay. I, you know, like purity. Um, so he changed. It shows us that he changed like many aspects of his his life when he became a more religious man. Like he stopped going to the cards, the card mm -hmm. games and stuff. Um, so I think it shows that he was pure. Um, he clearly worked hard. Like he, his health suffered for how hard he worked. Um, and while the hard work that he did did do a toll on his physical body and caused him to have, well, I, I think it seems like it caused him to have colitis. Yeah. Um, he was really reluctant to take um, the opium or the opiates for medication to deal his pain. And then even when he did, like, he swore off of them for his child. And so I think it shows that he, like, knew that his mental faculties weren't completely there and, like, mm -hmm. wanted – that was an important thing to him. Um, he gave service. I mean, he served – like you said, like, he was really unselfish. Um, and then in integrity, um, obviously it was not really easy to stick by the choice to live both – a religious life and a political life. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have been easy to kind of separate those things out and be like, well, I feel about this this personally, but like just too hard to, to do anything about it in Congress. And so I think it shows that he was, he had, he had a lot of integrity. So, yeah. I don't know. Do you, would you like to add anything? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I just found like three quotes that I thought really, really applied to Wilbur. Um, First it was, we ought to recognize that all honest work is the work of God. The next one is, therefore, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, and in your spirit, which are God's. And that's one's from Corinthians 6. And then a consecrated life is a life of service. Um, I just feel like, uh, especially with the second one, um, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. You know, Wilbur used his time on earth and his time with the body to to glorify God and to do his work and to um, help others see the glory of God as well. And then, of course, he served so much throughout his life. And um, he was very honest <laughs> in yeah. the things that he did. Um, and he was... He he never really deceived anybody, which I thought was really cool. So, yeah, I'm very good. Well, I really liked your thought on the second point, glorifying God with his body. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, the next one. Any other profound thoughts or personal insights from the movie that are related to child and family advocacy? So this one... I don't know, there were a couple of times when I like laughed during the movie because there were just some kind of silly parts, you know? So I just thought having a sense of humor is kind of important because sometimes it can just get really serious and tight and that may cause things to get out of hand. So, and when things are so stressful, um, just a humorous element can sometimes just be the healthy touch that's needed uh, for those that are involved in it. That was just kind of a little thought that I had. And then, um, I feel like I've talked about this a lot, but I just really liked the advice that he received from others. Um, and it's important to be open-minded and learn as much as you can from the resources that you have. And he used the wisdom, to, the wisdom of others to enhance his position and his arguments. So there's just some other thoughts that I had. What about you? I like those. I, I actually wrote like, I didn't really have any other profound thoughts. I was like, I feel like I've been like so like thinking about these big themes already that like I didn't really have many more original <laughs> thoughts of my own yeah. that I had not expressed. <laughs> no, that's fine. I say, I guess like the one thing that I said was that I felt like the movie was very encouraging that it showed that um, you could make a difference as one person when you're striving to fulfill your God-given role and yeah. responsibility to the best of your abilities. Because like I said before, like there have been times in this class where I'm like, I can't do anything to change these things. I know, it's, it's yeah. scary. <laughs> yeah, and it's like kind of overwhelming. And so I just felt like this, 
this movie was like a great reminder that like you can like you you are put in the position where you can make your impact you know so yeah i guess that would be the only other profound thought that i yeah it's all worth it <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what was your understanding of the doctrine of the family at the beginning of the semester and how has it changed? Um, so this is my last semester I'm graduating. And so I felt like my doctrine of the family understanding was, you know, hopefully pretty complete and like down packed. Okay. Um, and so I felt like as in terms of like, actual knowledge gained about the doctrine of the family, um, there wasn't a lot that I learned. However, I felt like I learned a lot about um, the climate of the family. Um, they're directly across their floor. Up. Directly across from us, you can see their window. I don't know what department number. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and so I felt like, um, before this class, to use the phrase from the scriptures, I was kind of someone that was like, oh, all is well in Zion. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's going to work out. Like, it's not, you know, it's not like there's been some hits and some dings, but ultimately, like, everything is okay. And um, I think that this class, as far as the doctrine of the family went, taught me a lot that, like, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to yeah. defend the family. And um, I feel like somewhat inadequate to do it. And and knowing what I know now about the family, like I still feel like I don't know enough, but I feel like I know um, the basic, like, I don't feel like I know enough to be a really um, effective advocate. Like I can't pull out stats and I can't pull out like, all these things but I feel like I have an understanding of the importance of family which is like enough to maybe make an initial impact in my little sphere of being a mom and you know like interacting with other moms who may feel similarly or like be looking for some direction and then you know as time goes on just being like more involved and being a better advocate so that's that was kind of how I took the mm -hmm. question. That I changed from being like a, it's all okay to like okay we need to I need to kind of step up. Yeah, I I feel like I can connect with you a lot, and I'm in my I graduate next semester, but I've finished like all of my required courses and all my religion courses, so I kind of felt like oh I know a lot about the doctrine of the family, but something that I uh, really learned is that the family isn't only central to God's plan, but it's also central to um, society. Uh, we need strong families in society, and I never really realized how important families were to um, to a. Uh, gosh, I just lost what I was saying, but you know, just how important families are in the world. Um, they are what keep us keep us going and they're what um, help us to know what we need to continue doing uh, for the children and for mothers and fathers so that was something that I uh, really took from this class was just how important uh, it is to raise families that um, can bring good to the world so yeah, especially strong families. Yes. <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> um, is that all? Yeah. Uh, so picture your spouse and children, current or future, and write down some thoughts you know, or thoughts about how they will benefit from you taking this class. So I'm married. I don't have kids yet. But I was just kind of thinking that by me being in this class, I learned to be an advocate, or I've learned to be an advocate, and I've learned to stand up for my beliefs even when it's hard. So I kind of hope that by me learning to do these things, it'll I'll teach my family to do those, and then they will become advocates, and it'll just kind of become a cycle throughout my family. 
um, where we just learn from one another and become examples for one another. Um, oh, and just also learning more about the doctrine of the family. I'll be more proactive in that and teaching them about the importance of the family, especially in God's plan. Um, yeah. Oh, and then I also was like, I just hope to really just be a good influence and example of my on my family and to help them through difficult times, just through the things that I've learned through this class. So yeah, I feel like that's pretty much sums up what I put. Um, <laughs> so I have a little two year old and then um, we're expecting our second. So oh, it was. Um, I think taking this course was especially um, pertinent and potent to me because I like saw their futures in um, a lot of the issues that were brought up and it was really hard to like imagine that um, some of the things that I feel so strongly about may be threatened for them um, and that they may not have the same opportunities as I did in, in some aspects of just education and it just lots of things. Um, so yeah. that it made it like really personal to me. And I think that's somewhat why it was like somewhat discouraging to me because I was like, I don't want that for my kids. I want yeah. something else. Um, and so I guess, you know, um, actually like when I had to take this class, the title of this class I was like a big turn off to me. I just felt like it was going to be like a, a bunch of bills and legislation yeah. and all, like, stuff like that goes through and like social work stuff. And I was like, it's going to be like the most boring class, but I it's actually been like my favorite class of the major. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just as far as what I'll take away from it is that there are some big um, changes that are coming or that might be coming um, yeah. and that I need to be more aware of those things and um, like you said really be an advocate so being involved in my kids schools and what is being talked about as far as education there and um, how education is approached and being involved I really liked what you said like um, really stressing the doctrine of the family to them. I feel like when I was growing up, that wasn't really anything that we ever talked about even. I mean, other than like the law of chastity, you know, like like those kind of things. But like talking, putting it in like a broader perspective um, is so important and helping them understand like, how the doctrine of the family connects in with um, Heavenly Father's plan and like drawing these connections for them so that they can understand um, like why some of these things are important to fight for, which I feel like is something that when you don't have that strong understanding, like you're like, well, one, one way is as good as another kind of for mm -hmm. a lot of things. Um, I, hope that I will be able to be involved in the community. I just put, I have to be honest and say, I don't know like what, a, what overall like grand impact I may have. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I like a simple life. And so I am content to make as much of an impact as I can in my own home. Yeah. And the lives of those who come into it. Um, I don't see myself on like the United Nations grand stage or anything. I don't know if anyone that we, you know, like learned about this semester really saw themselves there either. But yeah, you know, I just feel like as far as like my impact in my own little sphere will be like, I hope that I'll be able to carry out like just what I can as far as fighting for the family and um, just advocating for my children in, in every way possible. So, 
Yeah, I don't remember where I read it or who said it. I don't know if, it, if I don't know if it was for this class or another one, but it basically said like the first and most important step is to raise a family that you know raise a strong family. So that's like the most important work in family and child advocacy. So I I definitely like have the same feelings as you. Like I don't see myself going out to like the UN and even just in um, like state governmental type things um, to advocate. And maybe I will someday, but that's just really not me. Maybe I just need to get out of my comfort zone. I don't know, but <laughs> um, I definitely you know, like, I like the simple life, like you said, and I just, I plan to just raise my family and hope that that has a good enough, a great enough effect on others. So. Yeah, I really like the um, advocacy in the home was like our last lesson. <laughs> yeah, we learned about like all these like really impactful, I guess, like really visible ways of being an advocate. And mm -hmm. Like I never, like I saw the importance of them and recognized that, but I never felt like I, it was like my place to yeah. do that. And so I think like ending with advocacy in the home, like you said, is encouraging and that like it validated, I guess, like what my role could be, you know, or like it validated what I felt like kind of was a more realistic expectation of what I would yeah. do in my life, so. Yeah. Anyways, um, any other thoughts or I'll go ahead and end the broadcast. Yeah, that's it. Cool.